When was the first time you used Photoshop? Ah, uh, the very first time was probably in the mid '90s, around 1994, when I got my first Macintosh Quadra 660 AV audiovisual. I used it with my brother. It was Photoshop 2.5 or 3. So it was a long time ago. None of that CS3 stuff yet. Do you recall your first graphic editor? Yeah, it was Geos Paint on the Commodore 64. And it was very primitive compared to what we have nowadays. It was 16 colors, uh, 8 by 8 squares, where, where it could have only put two colors at a time. It was really, really limited, but I got a lot of thrill out of it, especially watching the pattern fill tool, because it literally went line by line. <laughs> it was like watching paint dry. <laughs> Cyber paint. And then I got to deluxe paint on the Amiga and color it on the Mac. That was before Photoshop even, and so on and so forth. Do you have any of those works saved someplace for posterity? Ah, yes, I do. I archived them onto a floppy diskette, the you know 3.5 ones, 1.4 meg. <laughs> well, less when it's formatted. But then I transfer them onto CD, then onto DVD, so I still have some of them with me. Of all the graphic editors, which would you say is your favorite? Uh, I would have to say, right now, Photoshop. Generally speaking, I mean, whose isn't, right? But at the same time, while it's very heavyweight, I also like using ArtRage. It's like, I think, 20, 20 bucks or so, 25 bucks maybe. And it's really intuitive, really simple and elegant, and it really encourages artistry. And I've made a lot of textures with it, and it's really, really beautiful. And I've used other things like Corel Painter too, of course. But Corel Painter, is, it's got a really crappy interface for all the development it's gone through. I'd expect something a lot better. So in terms of usability, Ability and really encouraging the artisan side, I like art rage tons. Did you train formally in graphic design? No, I just I went to high school, I did some stuff at like I printed out prom tickets and <laughs> posters for dances and stuff. People like to deface those. I never liked that, but I put them in such a way that it was like aliens dancing so it could have some fun. And <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, it was pretty much experience, spending my time after school, really just working and making one thing after another and learning from that and putting stuff in the buckets afterwards. I like to have artistic periods where I'm focused and really grinding away like on the weekends when I make my textures and doing that in really, really concentrated batches and then looking at it afterwards. It's like the artist's well gets drained and the creativity flows back. <laughs> Speaking of textures, I've used your textures, my team's used your textures, often in a case where we just needed single pieces of art and we put them on the wall and uh, they're, they're beautiful, they're quite striking. How many textures have you made? I've made almost 600 formal ones that I've released, so about 590 to be precise. There's some secret packs and some outtakes which I haven't released. I might do more in the future, but as it stands, that's the number. And thank you very much for letting me know this. I like you sharing with me. Where can people get your, your textures? Ah, go to, if you're in Second Life, the online world, my favorite, go to torley.com forward slash office. That will take you in-world to where my textures are. And if you're on Flickr, search for Torley Textures, because I have them right up there in high-quality PNG format. They're all 512 by 512 pixels, and they're seamlessly tiling. <laughs> <laughs> we rock. <laughs> okay, are you ready for your next question? Uh, yes, let me just hit pause okay. here. Torley. What is your favorite season? Ah, uh, this reminds me of George Winston because I always think of his albums that are named after seasons. But I used to like summer because that's where my birthday is located. However, in more recent times, I really like fall. I really like seeing the pretty colors of leaves. I grew up by a lot of maple trees in Canada. And seeing that, it kind of transitions as thing, the life sort of decays. and then But you know there's going to be renewal in the spring. So I like temperatures that are relatively cool, but the sun is still out, if that makes sense. Sense, but right now I'm gonna have to go with fall. Is pink and green your favorite color? No! <laughs> Surprise! It's actually turquoise or cobalt blue, that sort of range there. I really, really like it. Pink and green and black, and sometimes a touch of yellow, is my favorite palette and my favorite color scheme overall. But as you can see, I'm wearing this is my favorite color. If you want to know this right here, it's not gonna be exact RGB values. It's a very bright silk shirt, but yeah. Blue's where it's at for me. That's why my avatars will often have blue eyes and that they're not green and pink. In case you've ever been wondering, now you know.
Are you following the election this year? Not particularly, no. I go on pop girls and I read the headlines and there's a lot of stuff, you know, like, oh, Hillary's treating Obama really mean and all that. And I, there's cartoons and various other satirical sketches, uh, like the Saturday Night Live stuff. But overall, not a whole lot. No, there's a lot of talk, talk, talk and not enough action. And by action, I mean positive things that change and help people's lives, not just holding up babies for press photos. Are you interested in politics? I am to a degree, and it depends what you specifically mean within that. I'm very intrigued by human action, interaction within each, which we, with each other, like within social classes, and also how people respond to campaigns and publicity and mind control. Uh, <laughs> overall, though, I'm not interested in the bickering. I'm not interested in the, the BS that comes with it and all the words, words, words wars. I'm not interested in that at all. It's wasteful, useless redundancy. Are you currently running for any political office? No, no, <laughs> nor religious, although I could start a cult if I wanted to. <laughs> okay. uh, would you have an interest in running for political office? We often hear totally for president. <laughs> I'm so flattered by that. Not just flattered, I'm honored. In the future, I very well might be. I'm keeping it open, depending what comes up. But of course, I don't want to do things like hold babies for press photos. That's not going to do much good. Not that I have anything against holding babies, but it's just when it's symbolic and I don't actually care about the baby. It's like, hey, look, photo op. I'm not for that. But in the future, if I could enact change through that, if it would help me get the word out there about the sorts of things which I believe in, which are G PT, that stands for good, pure, and true, then I'd be up for it. I understand you feel strongly about data backup. <laughs> yes, what I steps do. should people take to ensure that they don't have data loss? Okay, first and foremost, like the saying goes, to go forward, you must back up. And this applies just about anywhere because computer hardware storage hard drives nowadays, they get so affordable. It's like $120 for uh, US dollars for 500 gigabytes. One of the first things I would ensure is getting a cheap but usable hard drive. I recommend eSATA, E-S-A-T-A over USB 2 because it's about three times faster approximately. And if your motherboard supports it or you can get it, then it'll help you back up things quicker. And that's good. I recommend using a backup program like Acronis True Image, which is wonderful. What it does, it creates a whole image of your hard drive. So if something gets wiped, you can restore it exactly as it was. And this has happened to me on two, maybe three occasions. It really saved my ass. In addition to that, I would recommend, of course, having it run probably at least nightly. I have, I have mine set to run every two nights and I make extra copies of it on more than one hard drive. And this, of course, is something even if you're a casual user, then you're going to want to make some multiple copies of it. That way, if one hard drive fails and again, it's cheap, then you can have another. And of course, time to time, when there's small files, I would recommend emailing them as compressed attachments to yourself, like if they're little graphics or if they're text files with important information, because that way you can access them from anywhere and plus you have a backup of that data. It's so easy to copy and paste, so why trouble yourself by not backing up? It gives you the so-called peace of mind and it just makes you feel a lot better knowing that if something goes horribly, strenuously wrong, that you can restore it in within a few hours. What makes a griefer a griefer? Ah, uh, the, the psychologist's question. I know so many media articles have their own spin and take on this. And really, it depends on who the individual person is because, oh my gosh, there's turkeys out in the... <laughs> I'm getting distracted. Sorry. Turkeys aren't griefers. They could be, though, if they were coming up to you and plucking, plucking, plucking your eyeballs out. But that's not good. But anyway, back to the question. Griefer, if... Uh, let's, uh, let's ask, what would make me a griefer? Okay, and for me it would be boredom because in the absence of anything else I could do, I like to be mischievous and pull tricks on people and I understand that could get out of hand were I to be malicious. I've been on forums before that I've trolled. <laughs> I know that's not funny. I'm, 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 it's not supposed to be funny. Very serious, <laughs> Yes, I'm very serious. I'm, I'm of course regretful and I've... Uh, send my apologies to the people that I trolled and flamed and did other sorts of nasty things to. In hindsight, 
But of course, boredom is my prerogative. And seeing social, social conditioning, seeing how people would react, both now to good things, but previously to bad things, unfortunately. So if I wanted to be a griefer, boredom would be the big one, not having anything else to do, like, you know, what the heck is there to do? And I think that's true not just for online worlds, but uh, first life, the so-called real meat space behavior as well. Okay. Um, it, within Second Life itself, in World, there used to be a lot of grid attacks, or what seemed to be a lot of grid attacks, that would take down the grid. But now, I can't really remember the last time that that happened. What changed? Well, part of it, I think, and I don't mean to generalize, there's certainly specific instances and, again, motives. But with something like griefing, if you grief long enough, if I was going to be a griefer, then it itself would become boring. I would come to know people's reactions. I would begin to see patterns and things within the system, which I would just do repetitively and maybe in greater amounts. But then I would guess, uh, say, you know, what else here is new? So perhaps part of it is the boredom of not having surprises. It's like, okay, we, we hurt Linden Lab servers. What else is new? And that really sucks. Of course, there's so many positive things out there which can be done by creative minds that are bored. I think part of it also has to do with Second Life that's gotten quite big now, and we've certainly gotten more resilient in a number of respects. For example, we don't really have long scheduled downtimes. These uh, service outages nowadays, we have rolling restarts. So things, instead of being in big block chunks, they tend to be more incremental. And things which were noticed previously on a smaller scale, they don't really go notice so much anymore. And again, you know, if there's a lot of griefing, people kind of go, ah, oh, they get used to it and they find ways to deal with it. But it doesn't attract the attention that some might hope for. Okay. Are you a secret grief or a toilet? No, not, not <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but, but seriously, I think, well, well, there's kind of humor looking back at things like pranks. First and foremost, people who don't know you, who have never met you before, they don't know who you are, and I think it's a very poor thing to hurt them, to be that, if that's your first action, to do something that could cause them that sort of harm. I think it's better to find out someone's boundaries and what they're comfortable with in terms of humor. Because I know a lot of griefing uh, is sometimes misconstrued as jokes gone wrong when that may or may not, in fact, be the case. However, it's always nice to ask first and get to know someone before you pull a practical joke on them. You don't want them having a heart attack because then they die and that's really not cool. You give your music away for free. Why do you do that? I love to share. <laughs> that's one of the things, certainly. And there's greater context behind it because in about the year 2004, I stopped composing due to hyperacusis. And my ears aren't still very that good, but I've grown more resilient to my condition. So at the time, I was like, well, the world's got to hear this music. I can upload it all in MP3 and put it on the Internet Archive, and thanks very much to them. So it really came out of both, I think, a need for me to want to be creatively expressive and put this with the world, and it was sort of an experiment as well. And by that, I mean that I've never before uploaded so much or created so much in a really big batch, and I thought it would just be a fantastic thing and I know I've continued this sort of trend with my solo piano works. I like to record piano and relax and release that those as albums, lots of little pieces. I've done hundreds of those now, and there's going to be more. There's a solo piano seven on the way soon. And a big impetus of mine is having giving music without the sorts of really restrictive rights, because I know there's people who like to use my music in film trailers and ads and things like that. And Creative Commons licensing has been wonderful for simplifying that. So as I was mentioning earlier, we're sort of an experiment to in that breaking away from traditional copyright. And although as I don't, I don't see it as particularly revolutionary, but I do see it as just something that takes a lot of clutter out of thinking about legalities. Because when I want to enjoy music, I don't want to think about large pages of lawyerly documents. I want to groove with it. I want to live and move, feel vibrant and passionate about the music. And I hope my listeners do as well. That's why I enjoy sharing so much with you. Do you want to write a book? 
Yes, I do. I've had ideas for quite a long time. I think if I was going to write a book, I'd like to do a compilation of short stories. Right now, I don't have nearly enough attention that's required of a full novel or even a novella or novelette. I'd like to do short stories and really just assemble them into a really cool collection. It'd probably be science fiction. I would like to do a photo book as well. Perhaps the two could be one project. We shall see about that. But I, I've been taking a lot of Second Life photography, and I know there's been some very successful photo books out there which look gorgeous. And I'm inspired in that vein as well. So in terms of exploring the literary arts, poetry is another option that I could get into. So it seems to be pretty eventual. So watch this space and keep checking on me. When they make a movie about your life, who will play you from today's leading actors? Okay, well, not necessarily leading actors. No discredit to their reputation, of course. But I really like Russell Wong. No relation. He was in Vanishing Sun long ago. He was in Joy Luck Club. I didn't really care for that performance so much. But I think he's, he's wonderful. I, I wouldn't be opposed to, like, a Caucasian or an African-American, or as my dad says, Afri African person playing me. It's about the attitude, really. Because watermelon is for everyone. And not just, like, there's horrible stereotypes with watermelons and African-Americans. And I know I'm diverse verging here, but I really enjoy watermelons and fried chicken. It doesn't take any stereotype to realize that. They're both really yummy together. There's no making that very cluttered or overcomplicating the matter. I would like well, I don't know. If, uh, if I was to think of other options, I wouldn't be opposed to even a robot playing me if they could get the emotional range and all the crazy gays around and stuff. But yeah, Russell Wong probably, Jet Li, uh, Chow Young Fat. I know they're all obvious choices. Oh, oh, I know, I know, I know. Stephen Chow, he's great. He was in the Shaolin Soccer and uh, the Kung Fu Hustle, and he's got that new one. It's a CJ7 coming out. Uh, I, I heard that's got a really mixed review so far, but in terms of having comedic range, being a wonderful actor who also has the, the the sort of a lenient grace with his more poetic and uh, the somber scenes, I would really, really have to idolize and look up to him and be honored if he wanted to play me in a movie. But as for a, a young Torley, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> thinking about my earlier days, we're going to have to see about that one. When does your long-awaited Torley products line launch. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, and I'm not into over-commercialization. I'm not a zealot about that, but at the same time, I realized that, and I'm really, I really, really find it cool when people make watermelon kinds of products, which are unofficial, but nevertheless cool in Second Life and give that to me. I don't have a specific date on when I might introduce official merchandise. I would like to do some experiments with t-shirts and posters. I know Michio Kaku has got some really cool science posters, and he really hawks his books a lot. He's a great, great guy. So in terms of really getting the watermelon monetized in terms of products, that's still an avenue I'd like to explore in the next few years, I think, at the latest. But I know that's sort of abstract and vague, but it's an open slot. Do you have any pets? No, not at the current time. For the longest time, I've wanted a cat or perhaps a rodent like a gerbil, one of my favorite stuffed animals. I've had him since I was a little tot, and his name is Clover, and he has a wife named Clovette. They're very much in love to this day. In terms of cats, though, my beautiful wife, Jennifer Ravenel, she suggested having a Maine Coon cat, and they're quite big. I like that. They're probably very cuddly. I like many kinds of cats, so I like the kind of Scottish folds with the photo back gear. I like Siamese ones for their perceived elegance, anyway. But yeah, in the future, cats are it would be pretty cool. Right now, I'm kind of growing plants, a couple of them. My, my wife, she got me Amaryllis, and she got me Bonsai as well, both very nice. And we're going to see how those shape up. And I like to say, I love you, Jennifer, and you are my pet. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 okay. Ha, ha, ha.